So it sounds like, from your view, yeah. we're losing the war on terror. Uh, yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Ian Bremmer and this is your G Zero World. I'm here right in front of the New York Times global headquarters where in just a moment, I'm gonna go upstairs and talk to foreign correspondent and go to world on ISIS, Rukmini Kalamaki. But first, your world this week. So first to Las Vegas, yet another record. 59 dead, over 500 injured. You've heard, I'm sure, the headlines over and over and over again, one individual and lots of guns. Lots of stories that come out of this. One is if you're the United States and you're trying to tell other countries what to do and how to live their lives, a lot harder when they're seeing this kind of violence, this kind of dysfunction on display in yet another American city. But in terms of gun control, we should recognize that actually homicides down in the United States over the last 20 years, gun-related deaths in the United States down over the last 20 years, a lot higher than in Europe, certainly than Japan, but no one wants to talk about that story after you have a big mass murder. Then you have the issue of big special interests. And this isn't just about the NRA. How about Big Pharma, the AARP, and why the United States can't possibly have health care that is affordable and functions for its population? In China, the state captures corporations. In the United States, special interests and corporations capture the government. That's ultimately why representative governance doesn't work well for Americans and why the most important interest coming out of 59 people getting killed is gonna to continue to be ensuring that the NRA is well serviced. Now to Puerto Rico, poorer than any American state, but three and a half million Americans that can vote living there the third major humanitarian crisis after massive hurricanes hitting Texas and then Florida. This was never gonna be easy to do. FEMA, the emergency responders, aren't built to handle three storms of this size, but it was made a lot worse by the fact that a lot of Americans don't realize that Puerto Rico is actually part of the United States, and Trump seemed to play right along. Trump's willingness to go after the identity politics issue served him well with the NFL, certainly with his base. It's actually pretty popular among a majority of Americans. But going after Puerto Ricans, even politicized mayor of San Juan who can't stand Trump, that's never a wise thing. And as a consequence, Trump's trip down to Puerto Rico just on Tuesday didn't go so well better off allowing the Puerto Ricans to get back on their feet with a lot of support from the American military. The big story going forward is that a lot of these people are gonna leave and they're gonna end up in New York. They're gonna end up in Florida and places like Tampa. Again, they're gonna vote and that's gonna change the way we think about some of these constituencies and where they end up voting in midterm and 2020 elections. And now to Spain. Or should I say Catalonia? At least that's what they'd want me to say. They just had a referendum on independence that uh, was not actually legal. Uh, the Spanish courts ruled it against it. Uh, what the prime minister Rajoy should have done is just let them vote and say it's symbolic, it doesn't mean anything. Instead, he plays hardball. He goes against the Catalans, sends in the police. Most of them end up voting anyway you've got a whole bunch of police that are striking out against Catalonian citizens. Over 700 injured, only two actually hospitalized, but the story and the videos were about the Spanish police cracking heads. That's not exactly what the European Union came together for. Rajoy is in trouble now, and the Catalan government is gonna push much more legitimately from the support of their own people now against Madrid. The big takeaway here is that in Spain, just like in Germany, just like in Italy, just like in the UK after Brexit, governance is getting hard and the central government is seen as less legitimate from a lot of their population. Now you see a lot more Europeans who say you don't represent us. And now your big interview.
the charter of the city that- I'm here today at the New York Times boardroom with Rukmini Kalamaki. She's the foreign correspondent at the New York Times and go-to journalist on all things ISIS. Rukmini, very good to be with you. Hey, let, let me start with yeah. right now, yes. which is this horrifying act of depravity in Vegas. Sure. Which ISIS appears, at least from my perspective, to have absolutely nothing to do with. Right. But they claimed that it was them. They did, what, yeah. First of all, I mean, did that come from a real ISIS source, or was this sort of fake news? Uh, it absolutely came from a, from, from a real ISIS source. So ISIS now has a chain of custody when they put out their claims of responsibility. And typically the first um, media outlet within ISIS that puts it out is something called the Amok News Agency. I call it the Associated Press of ISIS. It's basically their wire service. And they put out all of these claims. So it was indeed Amok uh, mm -hmm. in their encrypted channels on the app Telegram mm -hmm. that put it out. It was then picked up by something how, called... How soon be between... The uh, so the, the attack was around 10 p.m. Yep. Um, Sunday night, I believe. Right. And uh, it was morning Monday. Okay. Um, so less than a day, mm -hmm. uh, which is typical. They, okay. t they tend to take 12 to 24 hours to, to claim things. Uh, it was then picked up by Nashir, which is um, an, an, another official um, ISIS uh, outlet. And from there, it was propagated on, on YouTube, on, on their channels, in their chat rooms, etc. We're all puzzled you know, by, by this claim. And the reason we're puzzled is um, contrary to, I think, what people think of ISIS. This is not a group that typically makes inaccurate claims regarding their responsibility uh, in attacks. Mm -hmm. They do typically exaggerate the death toll. Uh, they'll make it out that they had a larger role than they sometimes have. But in terms of claiming credit for things that they or their sympathizers um, have done, they have generally been, uh, been correct. And I can give you a, a number of examples where, where both uh, officials, the FBI, um, European intelligence uh, poo-pooed the claim. Mm -hmm. Only and for us, yeah, and and, and probably probably the most obvious one is um, soon after the Paris attacks in November of 2015. You might recall that that ISIS claimed that they had downed uh, the Metrojet flight that was flying from um, from from a resort in Egypt back to Russia, mm -hmm. killing several hundred people. Yep. Everybody, everybody I talked to um, said that that was not possible, and very soon after, ISIS claimed it by one of their regional affiliates. Uh, everybody thought that they were lying, um, and then uh, not, not long after, in their magazine, uh, they published images of the type of bomb that they had used. They said that it had been uh, hidden inside of a soft, uh, soft can, a uh, soft drink um, inside the plane. Mm -hmm. And I think it was weeks or months later, uh, the investigation um, found explosive residue and concluded that it was indeed ISIS. So, so look, you have a pet theory at this point as to why they've decided that um, they want to be responsible for a Vegas attack they had nothing to do with? I, I, I don't. I don't. And we don't, of course, we don't yet know. Mm -hmm. We don't yet know what this guy's motivations were. Um, so what we do know is he was a 64-year-old retiree. That is not the demographic uh, of most ISIS recruits. Um, the if you think of an ISIS recruit, it's really uh, somebody like Omar Mateen, mm -hmm. uh, the Orlando shooter, young, uh, disaffected, um, uh, had a problematic uh, personal life, uh, and was deeply into their ideology uh, online. Now, why would they do this? I don't know. Um, but what is of interest is they're really bearing down on it. They're not just making the claim once, they're making it repeatedly. Um, they're, uh, they're having discussions with their own members because their own members are, are now, are now uh, facing, um, uh, are, are asking questions. So, um, so that sounds yeah. to me like you think maybe there's actually really something there. Everything says it's not ISIS. Uh, the age of the perpetrator, uh, the, the information that the FBI is giving us. But at the same time, I don't understand why ISIS uh, would, would go so strongly. Well, the other uh, thing I direction. guess I would ask is, yeah. has ISIS as an organization, you know, since effectively yeah. losing their caliphate, yeah. um, have they changed? I mean, I think they're... There's certainly there's certainly qualitative differences. I, I would not say that they've lost their caliphate. Uh, so I just want to I just want to clarify that one point. Um, I was I was just in Mosul. I was there for two months this mm -hmm. summer. I was there on the day that, um, when, that it the, when it was taken when the when the city was declared uh, liberated. Right. Um, even after Mosul fell, uh, there was still the city of Talafar that has since fallen. Now, just in Iraq, there is still the city of Hawija, uh, the city of Al Qaim, the Anbar Desert, which is where they came from. Right. Um, when I left Mosul uh, a couple of weeks ago, I sent an email to CENTCOM to ask for 
for their assessment of how many fighters uh, were left following uh, the fall of Mosul. And keep in mind, that's just the Iraqi caliphate. Mm -hmm. We yeah, also have Syria, Syria, right? right. Um, and they estimated that after the fall of Mosul, there were 10 to 15,000 uh, ISIS fighters left. Mm -hmm. If you go back through congressional testimony, uh, you'll find out that at the moment when, when American troops uh, pulled out of Iraq, several years ago, they estimated the strength of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, which is the group that becomes ISIS, to be around 700 fighters. Mm -hmm. So we're, even now, after the fall of Mosul, we're 15 times the strength that they, that they emerged from, right? And, um, and another comparison, uh, Ali Soufan, um, uh, FBI special mm -hmm. agent, yeah, no, is, is fond of uh, pointing out that on the eve of 9-11, there were an estimated two to 300 Al-Qaeda members worldwide. So what we're seeing with this group is even, obviously, taking the territory, incredibly important. Mm -hmm. But even as you take the territory, even as they face devastating losses of leadership, uh, of, of property, uh, of their riches, mm -hmm. um, of their base, they are still there. And I think that um, we, we have not yet figured out exactly how, how to really handicap this group. So what, let's go back to the question of how have they changed? Yes. And, then, and then I want to ask you what motivates sure. them. But, but what, sure. what do you see? Because, again, sure. it has to be clear. Sure. You know, so, from anyone that looks yeah. at ISIS inside the organization, that yeah. they have, they're, they're not where they were. Right. Even if they're right. a lot stronger than we still presume they are. Right, right, right. What, what has yeah. that done to them? So, so obviously, um, their infrastructure is increasingly in disarray. Um, their media operation uh, is less slick than it used to be. So one, one possible theory for what's happened in Vegas is that they've become sloppy. Um, they've made two other errors, at least, uh, in the past uh, six months. They claimed an attack in Paris that never happened. They claimed one in the Philippines that also uh, was not ISIS-related. So, so possibly, you know, as, as, they're, as they're losing territory and personnel, um, perhaps their capacity uh, to project uh, their power and to provide the services that they've always provided as, as a media outlet, um, a, as an organization that holds territory, is also being eroded. But the thing about ISIS is, is in the end, this is an idea. I don't think we have found a way yet to shoot our way out of an idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and because it's an idea, it's malleable. So even though they claim that the caliphate, the territorial caliphate, you know, was really their end all, they have, in, in the wake of losing Mosul, they have very craftily uh, basically moved the goalpost. They're now talking about uh, the, the caliphate in our hearts. You know, the caliphate remains, the territory, it's no longer a territory that's just on the ground, it's etched in our hearts. And um, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, who was their charismatic spokesman who was killed um, uh, last year, in one of his final speeches, uh, he talked about how, um, he, he talked about when, when will you, when will we declare defeat? Mm -hmm. He said, will we declare defeat when you grab the territory from us? Will you declare defeat when everyone, every last one of our leaders will be dead? He said, you will only declare defeat over us when you have ripped the Quran out of the hearts of Muslims. Yeah. Um, so again, you know, they're, they believe that they're fighting for Muslims. Sure. And, um, and, uh, a, and so they're very protean. And even as they lose ground, um, they, they manage to regenerate themselves. Um, uh, are you finding, um, you know, sort of similar stories in yes. how we are motivating and, and creating these, yeah. this extraordinarily disaffected group? Right. I think the common thread that I'm seeing in, um, in the young men, and they're always, almost always young men that I'm speaking to, um, the common thread is, is contrary to popular perception. They really do mean what they're doing, right? They're not joining ISIS because they were dumped by their girlfriend and, you know, and, and, um, and, and it's a way to, you know, get back at the world or uh, because there was some sort of school dropout and had, had no place in, in the society. They're joining it because it means something to be part of what they think is going to, is going to be this Muslim renaissance. They, 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 once they enter sort of this, you know, this echo chamber of, of ISIS uh, acolytes, they very quickly learn to shut themselves off from any external media. They call people like me uh, and, and you, I guess, um, the Kufar media, mm -hmm. the infidel media, the mm -hmm. crusader media. So everything we put out is wrong. Everything, we, we are agents of our governments. So anything that we put out is obviously untrue. And then inside this echo chamber, they are led to believe that, that ISIS is, is bringing back a Muslim golden age, a place where Muslims are going to be honored and, um, and powerful and lead an empire like they did hundreds of years ago. Uh, and, and because the killings are, are 
only aimed at the other, right? So the killings are of non-Sunni Muslims mm -hmm. in their eyes. Of course, Sunni Muslims are also being killed, but this is what they're led to believe. It somehow makes it okay. You know, it's Christians that are being killed. It's Jews that are being killed. They're, they're spies. They're, um, they're, uh, they're out to get Muslims. Um, and the ones that I'm speaking to, of course, are somewhat self-selected self because their, their ability or willingness to speak to somebody like me means that at some level they've pulled out of the ideology, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm seeing them at the point where they have um, been somewhat uh, disenchanted. You and know, with wh the group. what's disenchanted? Just the it, horrible conditions? Or? So, so, so the stories that I gather from them um, over and over again involve uh, a disillusionment that comes at the moment when they realize that Sunni Muslims are also Getting are, are also being mistreated. Mm. So, for example, um, one member of ISIS who I spoke to, who was involved in executions, uh, talked about how um, uh, you know he saw that he saw the crucifixions, he saw the beheadings, and he somehow justified them as you know as being as being the other the bad guys. And then one day he was pulled on execution duty, and the men that they brought in front of him um, uh, were older men, and they were protesting and saying to him, "We're Sunnis. We're Sunnis. Don't kill us. We're Sunnis. We're just like you." And the gun was in his hand, and he had to go ahead and do it. And, um, and that really worked him over. You know, suddenly he's like, oh, wait a second. If I'm also killing Sunni Muslims, then what, what are we doing? We're killing everybody. Um, so but even the, the enslavement of women, it's again, uh, it's the again, multiple rapes, again, it does, that, that level of atrocity doesn't matter as long as against the enemy. It's okay. They've yeah. swallowed that all. They, they, so it's always against somebody other than their group. So it's only right? when they see hypocrisy so it's, on it's the only, part of their own leadership. I mean, it, it's not only, but that seems to be, that seems to be the, you know, the pulling out story that 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 I find, um, at least the most convincing one. You know, the ones that have really turned the back, turned turned their backs on the group. Um, I've also spoken to ISIS emirs, deputy emirs who are in prison now um, in Iraq and Syria, uh, and who remain, you know, really um, quite quite deep in the ideolo uh, ideology and quite um, arrogant in uh, in their uh, in their assessment that no these things are not happening you know there are no abuses under ISIS I actually spoke to one ISIS Amir just before coming back here um, he was the police chief uh, of a small town uh, outside of Mosul and um, he looked very down you know when I was talking to him and I said to him you look you look kind of distressed you know what's what's wrong and he said, I really believe them when they said that because we believe in God, um, Muslims are going to be victorious. You know, I really, I never thought that I'd be sitting here in handcuffs. I mean, it's just, it's really like a shock to me. Okay. Um, do you think that ISIS should have done anything differently? He said, yes, I think we should have tried to find more job opportunities <laughs> for, um, for people under a rule. Crucifixions, that was okay. Mm -hmm. Beheadings, that was okay. Enslavement of Yazidi women, all fine. Mm -hmm. We should have just had a few more job opportunities, right? Yeah. This, this is how... Deeply, this guy is um, a, is in this particular world. So it sounds like, from your view, yeah. we're losing the war on terror. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, from from my view, we're we're doing all sorts of things that seem to make sense. We're going after the leadership. Uh, we're pulling back their territory. Um, we're trying to uh, cut down on their presence online, and yet the group just keeps on burgeoning. Both of them. Right, and I don't actually have an answer. I don't know. I don't know what needs to happen um, uh, in order to fix this problem. All I know is that uh, despite these various efforts, we're kind of just treading water. You know. You're right now. You're you are talking with an active member yes. of ISIS. Um, what's that like? In order to do this job, I've had to uh, compartmentalize, you know, uh, many aspects of my life. For example, if I stop to think about what he thinks of women, um, and, and that I am a woman, you know, there's there's very little that we can talk about. When I stop to think about what his what his idea is of how Yazidi girls, um, some as young as eight or nine, mm -hmm. uh, have been treated, there's nothing to talk about because I would just feel angry, right? So I sort of have to just put these things aside and, um, and really just be a reporter and, and go to him for information. Um, he's been useful to me uh, in terms of reading uh, statements that are being put out by ISIS. Um, for example, right now, he's telling me there's, um, uh, last week, uh, he messaged me to say that ISIS has captured uh, two Russian soldiers uh, and that they're preparing to burn them, like the Jordanian pilot. This is stuff, you know, these are conversations that don't end up in my reporting because what, what, what would I 
you know, what's the point of putting out something, something so horrific like that? Just today, ISIS put out an official statement um, showing a proof of life of these two um, soldiers, and he, he is telling me that they've actually been burned alive. So, you know, I mean, it's just, it's information I take in, um, and I try to use it to, to get my bearings, you know, um, in this group, um, and understand what's what and what's coming. Uh, and, and also on things like Vegas, you know, I see, I go to him for, for, for guidance, you know, do you, do you believe this? Is this real? Um, and, and try to suss out what they're saying. You've spent your life getting much closer to them than anyone that's watching the show will have done. For sure. How has that changed your view mm -hmm. of them? The, the major change came came to me in 2013, which was the year that I was able to get to Timbuktu right after Al Qaeda had left uh, the city. Before before I was there and before I collected their documents and began actually studying them up close, my impression of them was that they were just a bunch of guys in a cave, you know, um, just these kind of Neanderthal uh, people, backward-minded, um, uh, monolithic in their thinking. And the documents I had in front of me showed me, for example, that, um, that they were required to turn in monthly expense reports. I had the disciplinary letter that was sent to a, a very famous member of Al-Qaeda in Africa where he was being reprimanded for not having turned in his monthly expense report. He was always late uh, turning in his expenses. And so I suddenly saw that they're acting a little bit like a corporation, you know, that they have, they have financial rules. Right, so you, you, you see them thinking it through, right? And so having, it's like the revolutionary versus the pragmatic exactly, wing in any government. In right? any government, yeah. exactly, in any government. Um, and um, that was sort of the, the moment, you know, when I realized, okay, there's more to this uh, than that. And ISIS is, is, many, is many revolutions beyond that. Um, the, the, their caliphate uh, ran, I think, 14 ministries. Uh, the Ministry of Taxation, the Ministry of the Treasury, the Ministry of Agriculture, and these these actually ran. I have interviewed people uh, who were employed uh, in these ministries, um, you know, where they had stamps and acted like bureaucrats. So in many ways, it really did act, act like a state, a state that nobody recognized. So I guess my 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 big takeaway um, is I don't underestimate them anymore. I don't make fun of them anymore. Um, I see them as um, as far more complicated and textured, uh, and, and I, I hate to say it, but sophisticated, um, than, than we typically give them credit for. Well, a state that nobody recognizes, uh, there's not much more G0 than that. Uh, <laughs> Rukmini, thank you very much. Thank for you, my pleasure. For, thank you for, for coming here. Super Luigi. <laughs> Oh. <laughs>